Okay. Επίση, να σα πω, επειδή η διάλεξη θα είναι στα αγγλικά, εάν κάποιο χρειάζεται ε, headphones για μετάφραση, υπάρχει έξω. Ε, Mark, for you, in order to be able to understand the Greek part, I mean the questions, if there are That's any. Okay. That's okay. <laughs> you can handle. Okay. Okay. Ε, Σα ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ σήμερα που ήρθατε στο σεμινάριο για την επικοινωνία τη επιστήμη. Με άλλα λόγια, πώ μπορείτε να γίνετε καλύτεροι στην παρουσίαση ενό επιστημονικού θέματο. Είτε αυτό είναι σε μαθητέ, είτε είναι γενικότερα στο ευρύ κοινό. Μαζί, μαζί μα έχουμε τον Μάθιο Μπέικερ από την Οξφόρδη. Θα, σας, θα κάνει ένα 50 λεπτο, περίπου μια πενιντάλεπτη παρουσίαση και μετά θα υπάρχει δυνατότητα να κάνετε ερωτήσεις ε, για, όλα, για όλα τα κομμάτια του σεμιναρίου. Ε, ο Μάθιου... Like uh, he, uh, he will say a few things about um, his work and uh, what he's going to present today. Uh, we are very, very glad to, to have you with us. Uh, it's, um, it's not only an excellent scientist, an excellent educator. For us also, it's a very important member of our uh, Fame Lab network. Uh, yesterday, you had the opportunity to, to meet uh, uh, one um, member of this network, Mark Lune. He is going to be with us uh, tonight as well for um, um, a rock science physics uh, performance at 7 o'clock. Uh, and uh, tomorrow in the school, uh, school lab final, you will have the opportunity to, to meet uh, other scientists from FameLab, but also our new members of these, the, the school labbers. Um, many thanks to National Research Foundation for this excellent collaboration and all of you for coming today. Matthew? Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and for welcoming me to Athens. It's a real pleasure to speak in such a great venue. My friends inform me that many Nobel Prize winners have spoken here as well, so I don't know if we're going to have a Nobel Prize winning talk today, but we'll see what we can do. So my background is in biophysics. I did my PhD in how bacteria swim. But today I'm talking about how to communicate science. And I'm aware that most of this room probably have more experience teaching children than me and have a lot of experience doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm not here to tell you anything you don't know, but perhaps I'm here to remind you of the things you can keep in mind when you have to go and give a talk. So I'm going to start today by talking about how we can communicate. How do we focus on giving a good talk? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how to talk to a difficult audience. <laughs> So my background, I've done quite a lot of teaching in prisons, and people generally tend to think of prisons as a difficult environment to teach. I'm going to say that it's probably the same as a school in school in many ways, and a lot of you have experience in teaching in schools. And then the last thing is just how to communicate to any audience, in particular, how to communicate science. So I think everyone can speak. Everyone, if they were on a phone telling their mum a story about what they did yesterday, would be confident in speaking about that. And everyone can tell a joke. Some people aren't very funny, but they can still tell a joke. So why is it that when we get up in front of an audience, some people become very, very scared? Now, as soon as you stand in front of an audience, even if you say the same thing as you would say on the phone to your mother, people get nervous. People get rattled by this, and they get worried about what's going to happen. So this, about facing this fear is the first thing to be aware of. And fear, being afraid, is very similar to being excited. The two are very related. It comes down to an instinct when we were cavemen, if we're faced by a bear, do we run away or do we try and fight the bear? They're both very similar. And if you can learn to understand why you're afraid, you can become excited, looking forward to a talk. So the first thing to ask yourself is where do you feel fear? Everyone fe feels the fear of speaking in a different place. Some people get very nauseous, they feel very sick and they may even throw up. Some people sweat profusely, they look like they've been in the gym and they're just sweating on stage. And other people, like myself, get shaky knees. So because I'm aware that I, my knees get shaky, I can be ready for it. I can think, 
my knees are going to get shaky, so I should be low and ready for it. And by knowing the way your body responds to fear, you're more able to be prepared when you do get afraid. It's normal to be afraid, so you should be ready for it. So what do we think is important when giving a talk? Does anyone have any ideas? What kind of things do you think are most important? You've got a message you need to communicate. You've got a, a, a way of doing that. So does anyone have any ideas? Your audience. Your audience? That's definitely very important. Yeah, for sure. You've got to know your audience. Clarity? Definitely. Clarity is very important. You don't want to have a confused message. So one of the things that people have probably seen before in terms of importance, in terms of what people are paying attention to when you're speaking, is, is it your words? Is it your actions? Is it the way you speak? And ultimately, the surprise is that your words barely matter at all. Now, I wouldn't stand behind these percentages because when you look up this information, everyone's got a different number behind it. But the truth of the matter is, the way you say something is much more important than what you say. It's an unfortunate truth. Most people make decisions based on whether they can trust you, whether they like you. And whether they trust you and like you has almost nothing to do with what you're actually saying. So that is unfortunate because we're here to communicate facts. But it means you need to be aware of the way you're saying things. You need to use pauses to emphasize a point, and you need to speak clearly. You need to change the way you speak using vocal variety. So that's the main thing to be aware of, in that what you're saying is actually the least important thing that will determine whether your audience understands what you're going to say. So be aware of that. So something that, that people who undertake professional speaking courses, especially politicians and especially American politicians, is the so-called beach ball. If you see an executive in America or a politician, Obama, but Hillary Clinton in particular does this, she always speaks using beach balls. You're told to hold a beach ball. If you talk about a point, you can transfer the point from one side to the other. You can point to people with your open palm. It's a way of having confident and friendly body language rather than pointing at people like this or moving points around like this. That makes you seem threatening and also insecure. So it's a, bit, it's a bit over the top, and some Americans are over the top. They'll constantly talk to you like this, bringing a point towards themselves or delivering it to you. But it is a trick you can use to keep your language sort of, your body language, round and friendly. Now the most important thing, as you're probably all aware, is eye contact. I like to call it the Goldilocks rule of eye contact, because you can have too little or too much, but you want just right. So an example of too much eye contact is if I started speaking and constantly looking at this guy here, then he feels a bit threatened because I'm focusing solely on him, and the people over here are starting to get a bit bored because they feel they're not getting any attention. So this is an example of far too much eye contact on the same person. Conversely, if I keep looking at a different person every second, I look very nervous and I look very panicky. And people's attention will wander because they think I'm nervous and I don't know what I'm talking about. So what you need to do is look at people to engage with them, but move around the room so that you're bonding with everyone enough to keep their attention. And you should be able to look in an audience of this size at everybody for at least a few seconds. If you have a bigger audience, if you're a big famous comedian, Robin Williams, Eddie Murphy, Billy Connolly, these people performing to thousands and thousands of people, you obviously cannot look at every single person. But if you look at good comedians, they will check sections of the audience. So they will check this section, they might check the upper balcony, then they'll check down here. So let's have a look at a good comedian in action. Thank <laughs> you. 
αναγκασμό είναι η κυρία μου. Να, αυτό που έπαθε τόσο βαπά στην Κρήτη. Ήταν ένα παπά στι τηλεφωνήσει και δεν πήγαινε στην Κρήτη. Αλλά αυτό πήγε τότε για όλα όσα συμβαίνουν στην χώρα αυτή. Η πέστη είναι η κριτική. Τι και η πρώτη κριτική. Λέει, θα σα μιλήσω λέει, για τη Μαρία τη Μαγδαλινή, η οποία ήταν μια πόρνη από τα χανιά. Είναι βρεά σου, είναι κριτική, βγαίνω έξω. Ο παπά τίποτα στην αρχή και ξανά. Σήμερα θα σα μιλήσω για τον άσο το ο οποίο θα τελειώσει ένα βοσκό το ρέθιμο και ανοιχτό τον σκανσικλή από το ζωνιανά. Θα μα έχουν οι πιστοί έξω, πάνε στο μικροπολίτη που δεν πηγαίνει. Στο ρεθί του, το πιάνει σε δύσκολο σε παρακαλώ. Ξέρω ότι είμαι αντισκοτικό, πε το τι είναι, είσαι ψυχαναγκαστικό, αλλά πε το και λίγο πιο διαφορετικό, δεν πέφτει σε σχήμα. Πρέπει να το πω. Οπότε και εκεί βγαίνει ο παπά. Λοιπόν, μιλούσε για το μυστικό δείπνο, για να δει που δεν πρέπει ο ψυχαναγκαστικό, θα λέω, μα έφυγε λέει ο Ισού μαθητέ σου και του λέει απόψε κάποιο από εσά θα με προβώσει. <laughs> okay, now, that wasn't the best example of Lazopoulos looking around because that was the only example I could find where he wasn't swearing too much or making jokes that I couldn't say were going to be appropriate for the audience. But his problem there is that he has to look at the camera as well. He's mainly performing for people at home. So when the camera is focused on him, he has to deliver to the camera. But when the camera pans out, looking at the whole audience, you can always see that he's checking front row, checking the back row. And if you look at videos of him with distance shots over the whole audience, he's constantly checking the crowd. He, I mean, Lazopoulos is a very good performer. I speak maybe five words of Greek, and I can still tell that he's a very, very good speaker. I imagine if I even understood Greek. So the next point I wanted to make was about time. Time always feels like it's going slowly, but it's probably going fast. So one, one way to, to explore this is if we get, I'm not going to do it because I'll let you sit down, but if you get everyone to stand up and sit down when you think a minute has expired, if you sit down when 60 seconds has finished, almost everyone sits down at about 40 seconds, 45 seconds. So you can get your school children to play with this game as well. People, even when they count, trying to count 60 seconds, will count it very quickly. So nearly always you have to have faith that things are actually going more fast than they should be. And you should know your timings so that you can deal with this. Now, speaking to school children, you're probably not going to use much PowerPoint. But if you are giving an outreach lecture, you probably will use some sort of thing to display your slides. Now, PowerPoint is probably the most abused piece of computer software in the world. As, as a high school, um, in New Mexico, there was a science competition that was won by high schoolers. They beat university students across the whole of the US. And they gave their final presentation just with a pen and paper. And when the judges said to them, why aren't you using PowerPoint? They said, PowerPoint is for people who don't know what they're talking about. And that's very true. PowerPoint is mostly for people who don't know what they're talking about. But if you are going to use PowerPoint, you should know some of the tricks. So the first trick is the blank screen. I never knew this until someone told me. But a lot of people with PowerPoint will start looking only at the slides and not looking at the speaker. So you can blank the screen by just hitting B. So on my clicker, it's this button. So now there's nothing to look at, so you have to look at my ugly face. Alternatively, you can white the screen as well if for some reason you're opposed to black or maybe if you have a white background on your slides. The next trick that a lot of people don't know is you can go directly to slides. So if you hit G3, that will go to the third slide. And if I hit G10, that will go back to my 10th slide. So you know when someone says, oh, can you show me that figure at the start? Then rather than most 99% of people will go all the way through like this, which is silly. So you can go straight there with G10. And the last thing is you should use a clicker. I avoided buying a clicker for pretty much my entire life because I'm very cheap. But the bottom line is these days a clicker costs like five pounds. I don't know, that's probably about 5 euros and 10 cents at the moment. So you should really use a clicker. It's really easy and it means you can, I can walk around. It gives me the freedom to do things like this, putting my body in front of the slides, etc. It's a lot better than looking like you're stuck at your computer, unable to move. So while we're talking about slides, this is basically the first thing that came up when I did a Google for bad slide. So this is obviously the canonical bad slide. And from that, the main problem is it's too busy. I don't think anyone is going to understand what that diagram is about, that's for sure. Plus, it has far too many words on it. Generally speaking, you want less information on your slides and more information in your talk. The exception to this, I would say, is if you're speaking in a place where people really don't speak the language at all. I've given talks in Japan, 
and I think Mark's done a lot of work in Japan too, and some of the people in my audience could not even say hello. So there's zero chance they're going to understand a word of what I'm saying. And in that context, you do need to have a lot of stuff on the slides because they can read English a lot better than they can speak it. So this is also an example of a bad slide where I'm going to stand in front of my computer and keep reading the text on and on and on. Quickly, you will see that you can read more quickly than I can talk, and thus you won't be paying attention to what I'm saying, and you will be bored and your attention will wander. And just when you think it can't get worse, I will keep going, talking in the same monotone text that doesn't explain anything, but keeps going and going. And you probably have about a tolerance of one slide for someone who speaks like that before your just mind is a million miles away. We've all had science lectures like this, for sure. I certainly have been in a lot of them where people need the security of having the text on the slide. But it results in a worse communication experience, that is for sure. So what is a good slide? Well, there's an expression in English, keep it simple or stupid or keep it sweet and simple, depending on how offensive you want to be. But the theme is that you should always try and keep things as simple as possible. And Guy Kawasaki, who's a sort of keyboard warrior on Twitter, I think he has 500,000 followers. He's a professional tweeter, basically. He has 15 people who write his tweets for him. But he has a 10, 20, 30 rule. He says that all talks, no matter what they're about, should only have 10 slides, be 20 minutes in length, and have no font smaller than 30 points. Now, I've violated all of those rules today, but in general, especially that third rule, I would say is a very good rule. Putting up anything less than 30 points on your slides is completely crazy, because no one is able to read it if they're about four rows back, and they're not able to read it at all, if they're, even, if, even if they are close enough to see it, because there's just no time to read that text. If you have to use a font that small, you're probably trying to put too much onto your slides. So I've talked a lot about how to present your message, and I've said that what you're saying doesn't matter at all. But of course, at some point, what you're saying does matter, <laughs> because you obviously have a message you want to communicate, and you're interested in that message. So when you have a talk, how do you possibly remember all the things you have to say? So if you have a short talk, you should just memorize it. The advantage of a short talk is that you can practice it 20 times in an hour. If you have to give a two-minute talk, you can practice it 30 times in one hour. So it doesn't take a lot to just hammer home what you're saying. But if you have to give a longer talk, it's very easy to forget things. So here's a picture of the Snowy River in my homeland, Australia. This is in the, the mountains. People forget that Australia has snow and mountains. They think it's all kangaroos and desert. But there is snow, and this is where the mountains are. And if I wanted to cross this river, I wouldn't just charge straight across. I would use these stepping stones to get there. And this is an analogy for a talk. You don't need to remember always everything you need to say. But what you should do is think about where you're going next and where you've just gone. So if I was crossing this river, I would go over these stones. And when I'm on one stone, I know my next point, the next place I need to get in order to be safe and confident about what I'm talking about. And I know what I've just spoken about so I can lead into it. So that's one trick that people use. But ultimately, this is just an analogy and a trick. The best thing to do is just to practice over and over again. So as I said, if it's less than five minutes, you should just remember it. If it's longer, you can have key points on cards. And if it's very long, you should probably have some sort of outline structure so that even if you forget a little thing, you're still on message for the overall presentation. Now, the most important thing, really, as I've said, is to prepare. People think when they prepare that they should just fix their slides. Most of my colleagues in science, they'll probably work on the slides up until 20 minutes before the talk and never even practice the talk once. And that's one of the reasons there are so many bad presentations in science. When you practice, you really need to practice the talk. You can give a good talk with no slides, and you can also give a good talk with bad slides. But with the best slides, you can still give a very bad talk. That was a bit of a confusing way of saying that the talk is more important than the slides. So when you practice, make sure you practice the talk. And you can practice in front of a mirror. That way you can see what your face is doing when you're talking, you can see when to pause, you can think about what you look like and make sure that you're using the beach balls if you want to use beach balls or whatever you want to use. A, a good way is also with a camera. That way you really get a good look at how you look from an audience perspective. When you practice, even if you don't have a camera or a mirror, you should visualize yourself speaking. 
A lot of people sit at the computer and read through the slides. But if you can picture yourself on stage speaking to people, you get some mental preparation for that audience and how you're going to interact with that audience. So even better than that is to practice with an audience, whether it's a fake audience of your friends and family or a real audience. One of the best assets you can get in life is friends who are honest enough to tell you when something is bad. So instead of having an audience full of people who will always tell you you're great, you should try and find friends who will tell you honestly that you're rubbish when you're rubbish, because that's the only way you're going to improve. And last of all, know your timings. If you're up to give a 10 minute talk, or in this case a 50 minute talk, don't speak for the wrong amount of time, because it's rude, basically, and also it's just a wrong one. Everyone will resent you for doing that. So some list of do's. Quickly, make sure you practice, make sure you know your material, make sure you know your room. This is similar to knowing your audience. I went to a, a brass uh, conference, like brass instrument conference many years ago, and there was a very famous Finnish tuba player who said, you don't play your instrument, you play the room. What he means by that is that the sound coming out of your tuba is not really what everyone's listening to. They're listening to the way that sound interacts with the whole room. So you need to be aware of the room. You need to be aware of how you sound in that room because that's what people listening to. Different rooms do sound very different and the different parts of the audience will hear you in different ways. So another good trick is to go up the back of a room and hear someone else speak to hear what it sounds like. Now, one of the worst ways to get someone to relax is to tell them to relax. The only worse way is to sell someone, don't panic. There's no surer way to make someone panic than to say, don't panic. <laughs> but keeping that in mind, you really should try and relax. You know, if you're getting nervous, just take some breaths and think realistically, the worst that can happen is not very bad. 95% of the time, the audience is on your side. They want you to succeed and they want to hear what you've got to say. So ask your colleagues to help you and watch good speakers. Watch Lizopolis and tell yourself you're researching for a science communication talk. So don't read your screen. I've been guilty of that. Don't read your notes. Don't look at your slides. This is probably the worst thing. Like, I'm talking to you today about uh, what am I talking about? That's, that's the worst you can do. And don't look only at your boss. We've all been guilty of this. Like, if you're in a job interview or a big talk, you're like, I don't care about these people. This is my boss. Like, he, he's going to you know, control my money. But then you actually hurt yourself with your boss because you lose the interaction of the audience and you lose their attention, so you have a worse talk, ultimately. So don't speak too fast. I'm a serial offender in speaking too fast. And don't speak too flat. By that I mean don't continually speak in the same tone and turn from one slide to the next like this. That's a shocker and always happens in science. So also, my last thing I'd like to say really about general speaking advice is learn to enjoy that rush, right? So I said at the start I've done some work in prisons and that's where we're going to talk now about difficult audiences. But one of the more rewarding experiences I ever had teaching in prisons was one of, these, one of the guys, young guy, who was in there for stealing cars, he was terrified to speak. But after a bit of sort of practice and training in this, he said that he learned to love the rush. And previously, the only time he'd had that rush was stealing cars. Ultimately, he only felt important when he was stealing cars and he only had that excitement, which is one of the reasons why he was stealing cars. So you can really learn to enjoy the rush, you know. I think once you're capable of speaking, you, you get excited about it because you feel alive when you're speaking. So try and train yourself to enjoy that and then you will have the opposite of being afraid. So difficult audiences. Now, I've never had to speak to someone like this. This is the head of the MS-18 gang in Guatemala who was sentenced to life this year. He's a very, very seriously dangerous person. But um, I have had to talk to people who've killed people, and I have had to talk to prisoners. And most people think, oh, prison, you know, wow, that must be really dangerous. But I think that prison is in many ways an easier place to teach. So what kind of things do we think are important when talking to prisoners? Any ideas? Respect. Respect? Yeah, that's very, very important. Like, a lot of the guy, a lot of the men or women in prison haven't really had a lot of that, and so they're, you know, it's novel to be treated as an equal or with some respect. Anyone else? What about body language in prison? Do you think it's a good idea to walk on like this and like, oh, hi guys, I'm talking today about... <laughs> No, it's a very bad idea <laughs> to be like that. I, I think the most important thing about teaching in prison, and I would go as far as to say teaching in general, is your presence. It's particularly important in prison 
Presence and confidence, oops, <laughs> I've, I've got the auto order wrong here, sorry. Anyway, presence and confidence are very important because prisoners, like school children and dogs, can smell fear. You know, if you, if you look afraid, then you will, be, you will be hammered because people are out to get you, you know. In many ways, prison is a tough environment and people can spot weakness straight away. So the most important thing is just to be confident and also to, to have that presence. And I think the same thing applies in the schoolroom. Everyone's had been in a class where they had a substitute teacher who within two minutes, the class knows this guy's soft and he's going to have the worst 40 minutes of his life because he's, he's too soft to like, have that presence. Likewise, there's other substitutes who within 20 seconds control the classroom. And it's not about using the tools at your disposal. It's more about having the presence to earn the respect. So respect goes both ways, and you've got to demonstrate that you're worth respect. One of the things that actually makes it easier is security, to be honest. Because, you know, there are serious uh, penalties, you know, for someone doing something bad in prison. So they're all aware of that. In a school, you have less, less of that. Le unless you're in an in extreme school for people who have been expelled and stuff, you can't restrain students and things like that, and nor should you want to. But in prison, for you to even be there, there's a whole security apparatus that's backing you up. But you can't be their friend. You need to be their teacher, ultimately. And I think in many ways, pr prison teaching is easier because of novelty, privilege, and security. So I've taught in prisons in the US and in the UK. And for a lot of those times, especially in the US, I was for sure the only Australian those people were ever going to meet in their lives. So that, that already gives me something interesting. They're like, do you ride a kangaroo to work? You know, it's a joke, but these guys will never, ever meet another Australian, right? So they're, 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 they're really aware of that opportunity. And it is a super privilege. To even have a, a teacher come in, you have to be, like, security-free for years. So, you know, they don't want to lose that privilege. But you do also need to be aware. I say that there's security and there are people everywhere, but you need to be aware, ultimately, of danger to yourself. So the difference may be in schools. Well, first of all, I think the first two points are the same. Presence and confidence are critical. Children can smell fear, but you have an educational responsibility to children. I think more than with prisoners, although you do have it to prisoners, it's a very different kind of educational environment. One is adult learners, and one is young learners. So that's a very different way of approaching things. Most of the people in prison can't read and aren't numerate. And, and you have teaching an adult to read is very different than teaching a four-year-old to read. Another ridiculous story is in the 80s in, in Australia, in Victoria, because the educational aims for prisons were literacy, teaching people to read, all the materials provided were for four-year-olds. And they had the primary school teachers doing the teaching because they thought it was the same thing. We need to teach people to read. These guys are good at teaching people to read. We'll use the same people. But it's obviously crazy to try and teach prisoners with books that are like Daisy has a flower, spot the dog. You know, That's the kind of tools you had to teach adults, which is really crazy. I think the bigger difference also is you see these students day in, day out for years. In prison, it's a very transient environment. People come and go. Most people are on short sentences. So you have a responsibility to your students, but you also can build that respect over time. I think generally this audience probably has a lot more experience in teaching school children than me. So I don't want to tell you anything you don't know. I'm just using my experience to compare prisons and schools. So when we're communicating science in schools or doing outreach talks, there's an expression that we want to sneak science under the radar. Now, I don't really like this expression because it implies that science is something illicit that we need to conceal in order to surprise people. Most of us are interested in science. That's why we're here on a Saturday morning listening to me talk, above all. But also, that's why we go and give these talks. It's probably why you became a teacher in many ways. So you don't need to, to conceal it with a trick. You just need to think about why you are excited by it. So enthusiasm is the most important thing. If you're not interested in what you're saying, then why should you expect anyone else to be interested? So try and recapture why you're interested. And if you have too much flash and bang, too much, yeah, you know, classic, liquid nitrogen is a classic. Probably every school demo is just like liquid nitrogen, smash a banana, that's science. But what's the point of that? <laughs> liquid nitrogen is very cold. That's true. But other than that, you, can, you, know, you lose sight of what you're trying to teach and what's the interesting thing behind that. So there's some tricks. Demonstrations are a key way to get people interested. And you can do demonstrations with nothing at all. I'll demonstrate one of those. Using simple things you can buy or complicated things if you have a lot of time. 
So let's have a look at a demonstration with nothing. And this is shamelessly stolen from one of my colleagues. So if I can get six people up here. Can I get six people to come up here? Oh, five or six? Come on. Come on down. <laughs> yeah. OK. So assuming these people are all, uh, well, they are very young anyway, but assuming they're like another 20 years younger, we, we, would, have, we would have a better example of this. So one example. Oh, Oh, we're okay. It's up to you. <laughs> Four's good enough. Four's like six. <laughs> okay. So if you tell all the kids to run around the room, and the only rules are if they, if they run into someone, they have to bounce off, not too hard, and if they run into the walls, they have to bounce off. So can you guys just run around the stage? Bounce off the walls, bounce off each other. Ah. So, okay, this will pretty soon degenerate into a ridiculous situation with a bunch of seven-year-olds. So then you tell them, oh, stop. And now you have to do the same, but you have to hold one arm each like that. So put your arm on the tiny shoulder. Oh, right arms only. Okay, now do the same. You can run around the room. And if you have 30 people, you can imagine there's lots of little strings running around the room. Right? Oh, they got confused. Then the last stage of this is if you stand in two rows. Two rows of two. So better with more people. And now, yeah, put one arm there. Yeah, exactly. Like and you put your arm there. And now you run around the room like this. You imagine you have a bigger room, OK? So what is the point of all this? Well, the, the example here is that you have solids, liquids, and gases. The first example is gas. You're running around, bouncing. The second is a liquid, and they can move a little bit, but they have to stay together. And the last, if you have 30 school kids, you have a big web of people. So you can talk about crystals, lattices, whatever. Thank you very much, team. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Good round of so, you know... The point there really is you can do it with anything. You can do it with just the kids. You can play a game of stuck in the mud. You know the game where you stand like this and they go underneath you. And you can try and draw that into a lesson about something else. You just need to be a bit creative. So a simple demo as well. This is what happens when you mix milk and Red Bull. So I, I don't even remember how I discovered this. But basically, it's disgusting. <laughs> So, so, so that's the interesting point, to draw them in. But there's a lot of interesting chemistry here as well. It's, up, it's mainly happening because you're mixing an acid with a base, but also eventually the milk will curdle. And it curdles very quickly. So it starts to get really disgusting if you look it up close. Gross. Thank you <laughs> for the tip. And then, yeah, three minutes. So you can already see it's separating, and it's, there's a whole bunch of solid stuff in that. And then you can pour off the solid stuff and show how disgusting it is. So the lesson for this guy is don't mix milk and red bull. But you could choose to make that lesson a better lesson, okay? depending on what you want. The point is here, red bull is about 2 euros, milk's 50 cents or something. So you can mix the two together for nothing. And you can think of other ways. You can do Mentos and Coca-Cola. You can do lots of different things with everyday items to make a lesson. So I have to escape to play this video. So an example of a complicated thing is here, I don't know if anyone's ever mixed cornstarch and water. It makes a viscoelastic solution, so it's like, it's like silly putty. If you hit it hard, it's rock solid, but if you go slowly, it's like a liquid. So here's some um, Americans who like bowl a big bowling ball in a pool of cornstarch. So at the start, it's rock solid, but then as you go away, as, as it slows down, it becomes like a liquid and the ball sinks. So you're unlikely to make a huge pool of this, but if you did have the time, you can do a lot of cool things. You can get the kids to run over it, and they won't sink, but if they stand still, they'll sink. And that's a cool thing to play with. Okay, sure, sure. So I didn't realize that. Sorry for the at-home viewers. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, sorry, that was... I didn't realize it would autoplay. So my point on the viscoelastic thing is that you can do this in a small way as well. We've done things with buckets of this stuff. It's really just cornstarch. You buy it in a bag and add water. So we put it in a bucket and we put like seven one-pound coins in the bottom. And then you go up to kids. This is at festivals and say, if you get the, whatever you can get in one minute is yours. So they go, ah, they go really quickly to try and get the money. But then it's rock solid and they can't. So it's a joke. And they, if they're smart, they can go slow and get the money. But you're hopefully not going to lose much money on this. <laughs> hopefully you've got government funding anyway. So... Um, 
in any case, the point is they wonder what's happening here, right? And then you can teach them about polymers and viscoelasticity. So the other thing here, this example is about, um, this is just using videos, ultimately. And this, this is a bunch of people called the slow-mo guys, and they've got some amazing videos online. They've got videos of cats running in slow motion and of giant water balloons exploding in slow motion. But this is a really good example of physics. So this, this, he's filled a football full of water and he's thrown it at his mate, right? So, but if you look at this, this is a great example of Newtonian mechanics. The ball stops dead and his head just keeps moving. <laughs> Plus, it's, I, mean, I could watch this about you know, 20 times a day, to, to be honest. I just love it, like, boom. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> So there's lots of ways like this, you know. YouTube is a plethora of stupid videos, but if you think creatively, you can make these videos into something that's really useful for a class to see. So I most certainly am not an expert on these demonstrations, but again, Google is your friend. There are three websites here that basically just list demonstrations you could do in the class or in an outreach exercise. I've compiled these three links on Bitly. If you go to that Bitly link, you'll get all three of them. All of these are in English, but there are many people doing the same thing, and I'm sure there are websites in Greek. I had a look at the Schools Lab website, and I see there's a lot of potential to list things like this, things like this, and also contact people if you want them to come and do demonstrations for you. So really, if you've got a five minutes, you can find something wacky and cheap to do on the internet. So another way of making science fun is to use music. Now, again, cutting out of here. So that's a colleague of mine, Helen Arnie, who she uses a lot of songs to do musical comedy, but also to do science communication. So you can play videos like this, and then you can sort of analyze them with the class. What's funny, what's not? And Mark's a great example of this, and he'll be doing it later tonight. So if you haven't seen him, you should come and see him do that. Is it 7 o'clock? Uh, about then, yeah. About then, yeah. So I mean, the good thing about music is it's a good way of engaging students. You know, they like music. But everyone likes music. Some people like bad music. <laughs> but everyone likes music to some extent. So, you know, you can use that. So my background is more in rap. And this next video is of one of my colleagues doing that. But what we used to do, or what we used to do, what we do do, one of these games we do is he and I like freestyle about science. There's a thing like Ask Dr. Baker is what I've actually made up. So if you ask me a question, I have to respond in rhyme. And usually it's poor. Occasionally it's good. So ask me a question, a scientific question, Preferably, not a, like, you know, some personal question. <laughs> so, so a question from, from someone I don't know. <laughs> Anything? Or, or. How does the flagella work? Okay. So the question is, how, how does bacteria swim? And the flagella is the motor. So uh, Mitani is asking me about the flagella motor. It's rotated. It's powered by a rotor. I don't know how I'm going to talk anymore because I know too much details to make it simple like spores. Bacteria swim by flipping their tail. They walk around. Instead of floating it like a whale, they rotate. It's simple. Plain to see that you can get rotation if you exert force simply. It's, <laughs> it's easy to do if you do it like this. It's also easy to take the point and completely miss. Ultimately, it's a functional protein that assembles. When I'm talking on the mic, I try to dissemble to show that if I don't know what I'm talking about, I can still get roundabout back to the same topic. So you can receive it through your oral and optic. You can hear what I'm talking about. How do bacteria swim? Not by waving their tail like a dolphin, but instead rotating like a speedboat. That's the only way they know how to swim through the intestinal moat. Okay, so there's, yeah, there's an example of that. But you don't necessarily have to just go... <laughs> go brush up your freestyle and do this to your kids. But you can think at home of clever ways of doing this. And in particular, I'll show the video in a second. 
But my, my mate John is really good at this stuff. Like, I'll show you his video in a second. Completing rhymes. So he's done a lot of work with school children. He's on children's television in the UK as MC Orbit. So they, they have a kid's show and then he raps about the planets, right? But one of the things he does is completing rhymes. So he would be like, you know, something like, if I jump up and fall down, don't be mad at me. That's a force called gravity. <laughs> now, kids are really good at this stuff, right? So the other thing is, you know, it makes it daylight. When I go outside, it's fun. It's that ball in the sky. It's called the sun, <laughs> you know? Like, kids are really quick at that stuff, and they, they feel like they're participating if you do it. So both of those I wrote poorly and quickly, but you can think very easily at home, just write these down and think about ways to get them to complete it. It's particularly good with young children, like five, six, seven. So to show you what the, the master does, he chases the next one about the periodic table. I'm sure the translator handled that perfectly, so you should, should all understand every word of that. But just in case you didn't manage to follow that, this is, this is a transcript of what John said just in the first verse, just to show you how much science is in there. So every element can be recognized by its protons. Chemistry is basically the, the swapping of electrons. The number in the outer shell determines the reactions that are able to occur within atomic interactions. So now I'm breaking my rule about reading. Elements reside in the SPD and F blocks. Like if this was a garden, these would be plots containing groups that give order to all the atoms we have got. Like on the left there is metals and on the right there is not. So in one verse, he's got a lot of science in there. He's talked about valence electrons, you know, the, the outer shell determining interactions in chemistry. He's talked about metals and non-metals. And he's talked about the different blocks of the periodic table. So there is a lot of science in that. And if you want more of this, it's in yellow, it's a bit hard to see, but John's website is scienceraps.co.uk. So he has all the text and all of these for download and stuff. So check it out. I wouldn't think that you could listen to that once and understand everything that was in it, but if you play it once and then maybe talk through the different aspects of it, you can go through some, quite a lot of science and it's a way that is different for the students. So to summarize what I've said today, I think that today, I think the most important thing about communicating science is to show the audience what interests you. And so you have to ask yourself, why are you interested? 
even if you've been teaching for 40 years and you never liked science in the first place, there probably is something that interests you in science and there is something that you're attracted to about teaching science. So you have to ask yourself why. What is that? What interests you and excites you about a piece of science? Try and remember the first time you discovered something you thought was cool. Like, I don't know what the example would be, but, you know, yeah, how chemistry works or how it works. Some things like this. When you first learned that when you were a kid, you were excited by it. That's why you decided to go and become a teacher, probably. If you can understand that, then you can understand how to excite other people. And it's the same with teaching generally. If you can understand why people struggle to understand certain things, then you have an easier time explaining it. Classic example is calculus. My brother reckons that if you, if you were a genius and you understood calculus first time, then it's very hard to teach it. I'm not sure I agree, but it is true that if you found it hard to understand, you're much better equipped to understand why students find certain parts of that difficult. So try and empathise with the audience, and to do that, try and remember back to when you were excited and when you were learning for the first time. I think the critical point is genuineness. In the same way that students can smell fear, they can tell whether you're genuine. If you get up and start trying to rap and you're just not feeling it and you don't care about music and you don't care about these things, students will straight away be able to tell, like, this guy's a bit funny, what's going on? Now, the key there is if you don't believe it, they will never believe it. If you don't believe, like, this is interesting and this is good, they'll never believe that. So you have to, you know, really believe what you're saying. That doesn't mean, you know, trick yourself into giving a sales pitch. It means think about what the things are that you care about and try and convey that sense of enthusiasm for the kids. So don't tell people how to think, show them how to think. And use what's around you. Talk to other teachers. Everyone's been doing this for many years. Ask them what works and what doesn't. And ask your students, you know, did that work or didn't it? Now that may, may or may not be realistic for you, but it is good feedback. That's the way you really start to understand how you can make a presentation better to aim it towards a target audience. The overall aim here is to raise interest in science, is to get more children interested in science and to pursue scientific careers. And it's also to explain to the public that science is important. So if it's not perfect, it doesn't matter. It, it, it really doesn't matter if it's that rubbish. You know, what's the worst that can happen? Someone will think, oh, that's a bit rubbish. I might go and read up to see why that was rubbish. That's still an end result for science. So make sure, above all, that you have fun and you make that fun contagious. If you're having fun, teaching something fun, then other people are going to have fun too and want to learn more about it. So, Sase Haristo, Yatini Podiki, Mu, Stina Thina, and for your attention, and Haristo Poli, I'll take any questions. If you, if you do want to see more of my stuff, my website is fatmatbaker.com. So there's videos and a bit about me there. You can contact me on Twitter as well, Fat Matt Baker. This is me researching for this talk. I was getting into the local culture by uh, <laughs> hitting up a bit of this at home. So thank you. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's also acceptable if you want to get a coffee. We c you can talk to me individually, but I don't know if anyone has a pressing question or any question, or even a not pressing question. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I, th I think in interpreting the audience's desires, maybe we should break it up, but I'll go over to where the coffees are and you can approach me one-on-one -on -one if you want to ask something. Thank you very much.